The title of today's message is Backup. Um, if you've ever not backed up something like a phone or a computer, you know the feeling. I, I don't know that I've ever shared this, but this has happened a few times. I'll work on a message all week. I think I have it saved. And then I wake up, you know, on a Sunday and go to print it and come here and it's gone. And anybody know the horror of having something just gone? Now, thankfully, if you know what you're going to say, you rebuild it. But in some cases, that's a terrible thing if you've got a lot of information you're trying to back up. Another kind of backup you really don't want is a toilet backing up. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that probably don't need to spend much time on that. Um, so backup. You hear, you know, police talking about this. Um, we need backup, officer down, maybe uh, one of the definitions is a person or thing that supports or reinforces another. So someone to show up um, and back you up. It can also be musician, musicians or singers. Um, so do you have any backup? I'd like you to uh, turn to 2 Kings 6. And before we read anything out of this, um, one illustration I will use is the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. Hitler was trying to mount an offensive and, a, and take out the Allied troops who were coming for him. And he's kind of split their lines, a thousand tanks. It was just hundreds of thousands of troops. And General Eisenhower wisely sent reinforcement. And lots of casualties in the Battle of the Bulge, but uh, the Allied forces prevailed, and uh, Hitler was defeated eventually. So reinforcement is important. Um, as a country, maybe as a planet, but especially as a country, uh, as a community, and specifically as the church and as a church, I think, I believe, that we have taken a direct hit from the enemy. And if you look at the categories, um, socially, racially, politically, theologically, pandemically, economically, almost every category, an onslaught, and you think, well, man, can, can the... Can the church survive? Can a country survive? Can families survive? Can, can the world survive such an attack? Uh, I believe the church can survive. And some of what I'm going to talk about today is this. Not everybody in a church, and not every church, by the way, survives, and not everybody in a church survives. We have had casualties. Now, you say, well, how do you know what a casualty is? Um, if, uh, well, before I get to that, let's just say this, but we have also had reinforcements. So there are people in this church. So if you go to another church, I'm going to tell you, it's your experience too. If you've survived, there are church, there are people in this church who have survived the hit and the discussions and the pain and the sorrow and the, all the issues problems, isolation, whatever it is. How do you know you survived? You're sitting here. So I have tremendous gratitude and respect. You say, but not everybody that used to be here is here. I'll give you at least a couple of categories of people. The people that say, well, I have been transferred somewhere else uh, that, that God has sent me somewhere else, I'll tell you how I know who those people are. They communicate. They don't go absent without leave. You say, well, who do you think you are? I know, I don't think I am. I am a pastor. And I have responsibility with the elders of this church for the people of this church. You say, but we can come and go as we please. Oh, no, you can't. Well, you can't tell me anything. I didn't claim to try to tell you anything. You better be getting your orders from him. And if he tells you to go somewhere and you get transferred, then you go to somebody and say, hey, thank you, 
This is what God told us to do. We got transferred. We're going over here. But if you didn't get transferred and you just got your panties in a wad, <clears throat> been praying about how to use that word for a long time. There it is. <laughs> it kind of takes my breath away, but there it is. Um, you know, I just don't like it and I'm upset about blah, 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 some issue. You're, you're A-W-O-L. That's all you are. And God help the next place you land. Because if you didn't leave here right, you're not going to land there right. All right? So you say, well, I'm not happy. Let's sit down and talk about why you're not happy. I'm frustrated. Hey, I'm frustrated. So I am saying out loud, for those of you that have held on, maybe you want to jump ship, maybe you just want to stay home, period. And some of you, by the way, watching or listening somewhere out there today, you are staying home and you stayed home too long. And you don't have permission for that either, maybe. So I am very grateful for the people that are still here. But there's another category uh, that is in this room right now and some that are come and kind of thinking about it. There are some of you that are back up. And you have not been here long. Maybe you've never been here before. And unless you're wolves in sheep's clothing, which will blow you out pretty quick, but if you are here because the Holy Spirit of God transferred you to this church, I am very grateful for whoever you are because you are back up. You are the reinforcements that the king sends to hold the line. And you say, well, we were just looking for a new church or we just felt led. Let me tell you, all that is him saying a church the church has taken a hit, and he says, I need troops transferred and moved here and there. And uh, it is no small thing. Okay? So this is a very personal thing for me. I'm very grateful. And if I'm going to get 100% honest, we've had some people bail without saying a peep. Not a thank you very much. God bless you. People, in some, some cases, I've known for a very long time. So you can pray for me. Uh, I don't need to be getting bitter and angry and... I can suck it up, but I need to do it in a healthy way. Um, if you've, how many of you girls have ever been dumped by a man that didn't communicate? Raise your hand. There you go. We, all y'all. Oh, someone had to think about it. What'd you look at him for? He didn't. He, he married you. What are you talking about? <laughs> I know too much about that thing over there. So, so. Second Kings six. Possibly. Uh, these stories for me are just unbelievable. Verse 8, now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, beware that you, that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent some, someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Who's, who's the mole? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. This prophet... He knows, he knows everything you say, even in your bedroom. So he said, go and see where he is, so that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Do you ever feel like you're surrounded? Um, I think I've shared this. There was one night, a house we lived in, kind of a little bit west of town. The girls were young. And, uh, man, this was not a good night. Um, and Rebecca remembers this. All I can tell you is my house was surrounded. You say, by what? Nothing I could see. But I knew my house was surrounded. And we went through that house 
I mean, and stuff I never, I didn't know what to do actually. And we anointed doors with oil. We prayed out loud in Jesus' name by the power of the blood. And we fought. And I knew the enemy was after me and after my family. Let me tell you something. He's after you and your family. This is not some game. It is steal, kill, destroy, war. If he can get you to kill yourself, he'll get you to kill yourself. And so sometimes you just feel like there's no hope. We're, we're going to be run over. Um, one of my favorite scenes is in a movie, and I've done a sermon about this. Don't usually recommend looking them up, but Broken Arrow. And I shared this again with a family this week. Um, where you're being, you're being overrun by the enemy. And in the movie, Mel Gibson playing this uh, commander, troops on the ground, they're being overrun, and he looks both ways, and if you've seen the movie, he tells the radio, broken arrow. And when you call that in, in the military, in war, every force... Anywhere close comes to bear on those coordinates. And they will drop bombs within 100 feet of your position because you're about to be overrun and it's your only hope. Sooner or later, you will cry, broken arrow. Because you'll get in a spot that if he does not show up, you are not going to make it. And if your prayer in Jesus' name does not work, you are not going to make it. I've shared that I get attacked in my dreams, and I know in my dream, if I can just get his name out, I'm going to be okay. And I struggle and struggle, and finally scream out, Jesus. And it vanishes. Sometimes we have a caller, and <laughs> that helps too. So keep reading 2 Kings 6. So let's go down to Dothan. He sends horses and chariots and a great army. And when the servant of the man of God arose and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear. Why not be afraid if you're surrounded by horses and chariots and a great army? How could you possibly not be afraid? And here's the answer. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Do you understand that and do you believe that? Because if you don't get that, you will live your life of fear. And not only... This verse, then you go to the New Testament, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. You cannot get outnumbered, even if you're by yourself. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Now, it doesn't say here whether Elisha had ever seen what, what, what Gehazi saw. Maybe he didn't see. Um, I don't have to see it. I think it'd actually be a little distracting for me. Uh, my little brother has seen him. You're not by yourself. Whatever battle you're fighting, you're not fighting it by yourself. And if you are, something's gone terribly wrong. You don't understand you're not by yourself. So how could Elijah be so, so calm? The Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So... Elisha is surrounded, and the enemy is surrounded. And Elisha knows, I don't have any reason to be afraid. 
So things like this and statements, scriptures like greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, how could we possibly ever be afraid unless the enemy lies to us and we believe it and he says, oh, you're not going to make it. You're outnumbered. God's not going to show up for you. You're under attack and you're going down. Or you stand and you say, if I don't see him, even if he slays me, yet will I trust him. But it won't be for lack of protection. And if you go on and read this story, well, let's do a little bit of it. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. So he lied, but don't get too caught up in that. Um, so he led them to Samaria. So it was when they came to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and there they were inside Samaria. Now when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elijah, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then he prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria, Syrian raiders no, uh, came no more into the land of Israel. Defeated his enemy without having to even kill him. Psalm 68. Verse 1. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, a song. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let those also who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad, let them rejoice before God. Yet, yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. Sing to God, sing praises to his name, extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Go down to verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. You're not going to get outnumbered. You say, but I can't see the troops. I don't know they're there. They're there. You wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness. So yes, the enemy has troops. We got more troops. And then you say, yeah, but the enemy's got the devil. The devil is the enemy. Yeah, but he's just one fallen angel. Who is your God? Who is great like our God? Nobody. If he can't take care of you, you can't be taken care of. There is no one. Uh, without getting into a bunch of details, uh, we, my wife and I had dinner with a family, and for three hours, we had a conversation. This is a family that's having some challenges in their family with one of their kids. And we cried, and laughed a little, and I talked to them about prayer and fasting and some weapons that maybe they had not pulled from the arsenal. And at some point he said, I know you're very busy, you know, I can't believe you're taking this much time, blah, blah, blah. I said, dude, I can only be one place at one time, and God told me to be right here with you and your wife, and that's why I'm here. Now, what was I on that night? I was backup. I was reinforcement for a family who was at the end of trying to figure out what can we do? What are we not seeing? What have we not tried? Now you say, well, well you're a preacher. You've got to do that. No, that's not exactly how it works. 
That's maybe how it should work. Other than God telling me to go do that and sit with that family, my wife and I with that family, one of the number one reasons why we did that is someone showed up for us. If you've ever had backup show up for you, it's not really hard, you would think, to show up as backup for someone else. So when you hear of someone in trouble, a family in trouble, a kid in trouble, a couple in trouble, and you, it resonates and you go, oh, wow, been there, done that, that sounds familiar. Sure glad we survived that. Good luck. God bless y'all. Hope that works out for you. Instead of listening just a few more milliseconds where the Holy Spirit says, hey, you guys are an expert. You're up. You're the backup. Get over there and help those people. You say, well, I'm tired. You can rest in heaven. Matthew chapter 4. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry at 30 years old, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by by the devil. Very fascinating. Led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when, he, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said, To him it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So he survives the devil's attack and then look how cool heaven is. Verse 11. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now this is extraordinary to me because you have God who is man, God, man, man, God, and Jesus. And these are created beings that he had created. I don't know which ones were sent. But it's always nice to have someone show up from home. And heaven was his home. And they they all could see what's going on. They know what the devil's trying to do. And yet Jesus, even Jesus, needs some backup. The human side of Jesus needs some backup. Um, Part of the challenge in our culture is isolation. And you think, well, I can worship God at home by myself. Uh, Yeah, you can. It's just not going to go well long. Because you're going to get in your own head, and you're going to be cut off, no accountability, no fellowship, and that is one of the number one things we got going, is real connection, community, fellowship, where we see each other, help each other, challenge one another, encourage one another. It's a family. Matthew 28. No, go to Matthew 26. So this is before Jesus is crucified. Now, as I read this stuff to you um, out of the Old Testament and here out of the New some of what I'm trying to deposit is not that you think, well, I thought God was enough. 
Uh, the way God has set it up is clearly he's enough. Yes, you become a Christian. Yes, he moves in. He lives in you. Greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. All that's true. But we wrestle not against flesh and but, blood. My problem is really ultimately not with you or you with me. It's not people. You say, well, my husband, X, my wife, whatever, blank. Um, that's not your problem. Your problem, our problem in a city like this is not the people, it's principalities, it is powers, it is the rulers of darkness in high places that run a town like this. And so you have, de you have demonic forces at work and you have angelic forces at work. And as it turns out, we mobilize the troops. Or we call on God to fight in our behalf and take out, you say, well, this is silliness. I don't care what you call it, it's what it is. And about the time you call it silliness, you get your rear end kicked. Because you think, oh, there's nothing going on. Uh, by the way, that family we spent three hours with and made some recommendations, I texted him the next day, what's going on? And I had told him, if you will tell us when you decide as a family you're going to fast for this situation, we'll do it with you. He went home that night, started the next morning. He's fighting for his family because he knows somebody's after his family. So look at Matthew 26. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, I'm sorry, Matthew 26, 45. If you're really spiritual, you know what verse we're on, but for everyone else, I'll tell you. Matthew 26, 45, then he came to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is being betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going, see my, <coughs> my betrayers at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude of swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. So, here they come. They're surrounded. Here come the swords, clubs. There's a, there's a mob out here to arrest Jesus. Um, now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, whoever... Whomever I kiss, he is the one, sees him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend. <laughs> That's a powerful little word he used there. He knows why Judas is out there and still calls him his friend and knows within a few hours the guy will have committed suicide. Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus, stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. And then look at verse 53. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? So, you guys don't get it. You think this little mob is a problem? I could call 60,000 angels down here, whatever the number you attach to a legion. It's a bunch of soldiers. All I got to do is say, Dad, I'm out, angels. Now, imagine 12 legions of angels. You're out in a garden your peeps and here comes Judas and you think they're thinking what are we going to do and everywhere 12 legions of angels poised give the word we'll take them all out how could you ever possibly be afraid again in your life with this kind of knowledge. You get in a tough situation. You go, what are we going to do? You say, well, I know what we're going to do. We're going to trust him because we're not alone. And if you're a Christian, you're from the inside out, you're not alone. But as amazing as it is to know that you have God living inside you, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He, he's taken up residence in you. On top of that, you have legions, armies of angels that go with us. We are not alone. And if the battle is in the heavenlies, I don't live in the, in the heavenlies. I got I to gotta depend on these beings fighting my battles. 
They say, well, I can't think about all that. What are you going to think about? Well, I'm afraid. And that's why you're afraid. You don't think about the stuff that's real. And the, t- and the devil tells you, again, you're by yourself. You're not going to make it. You're alone. God has abandoned you. And you say, well, that's true. Look at me. I'm all by myself. You can't be by yourself as a Christian. It's not possible. Um, and just a little flip side on this, go to Mark chapter 5. And I'm not even going to get into the stories of missionaries who go into very dangerous places with tribes and all kind of crazy things happening and praying and trusting God and in their homes out in the middle of the bush somewhere. And later the tribe, you know, had come and surrounded the house and were going to kill everybody. And they become Christians and later come and say, why didn't you kill us that night? And they said, your house was surrounded. How are we supposed to attack you? angelic beings. You say, well, I don't see them. I don't have to see them. They have to be there. Because I got a God that said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He's not going to abandon me. He's not going to forsake me. You say, how do you know that? I'm his kid. That's how I know that. He picked me. What kind of dad would pick a kid and then ditch on it? You may have a category for that, but that's not my God. He ain't going to leave me. You say, yeah, but some tough things have happened. Some terrible things have happened. Some of the stuff we do, we bring on ourselves. And some of it he allows. You say, well, I don't understand that. I got nowhere else to go. I got to trust him. And you say, well, I don't get that. Yeah, you do. You tell your kids that all the time. Trust me. I'm trying to help you. Just do what I'm telling you, even if it's only 5% of the time. (laughs) That was an inside joke, and if you were here, you wouldn't know what I was talking about, but you're not here. (laughs) Mark 5, verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broke, broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. This is an out-of-control, demon-possessed man that runs and worships Jesus. What in the world? You can't even get Christians to do that sometimes. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? He knows who he is. I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. So this guy is not just possessed by a demon. He is possessed by a legion. And he, be, and he begged him earnestly that, that he would not send them out of the country. Like, please do not cast us out of here. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons, to look at that, all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went, went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. So you say, let's just say the ratio is one to one, demon to pig. And they jumped the pigs. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine." 
Then they began to plead with him to depart their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Take me with you. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. So there's an enemy. Uh, people say, oh, nobody can be possessed by the devil anymore. Good luck with that. I don't believe a Christian can be possessed by the devil. But a non-believer, yes. But this guy ended up a believer and wanted to go with Jesus. Who wouldn't? Uh, by the way, not a bad thing to remember. Jesus saves you, and sometimes a basic impulse is, take me with you. I want to be where you are. He says, no, you need to go to your friends and tell them what, what I've done in your life. It's not time to go yet. Second Timothy 4. We'll do this last. Second Timothy 4. And uh, let's start up here in verse 6, actually. No, you know what? Go to verse 1. It's, it's hard to leave this out. So this is, this is Paul writing to a young guy named Timothy. And he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Uh, be careful what you listen to. This is going on right now. Um, people go, oh, I don't like you preach about this or that. If you can't find what I'm preaching in the Bible, you come talk to me. I'll talk to you. You say, ah, but you skew this way or that. You just come talk to me. I love these conversations. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And then look at on a personal note as he's writing to Timothy. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. So he knows I'm out of here soon. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And then gets more personal. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Now you say, well, what is all that about? They ditched. And what does he say? Timothy, come quick. Let me go back to that family, the three-hour meeting. I was made aware of this situation uh, through actually one of my daughters. And she told me, and I actually had this guy's number. And before he ever reached out to me, I reached out to him. And he said, when can you meet? And within days, we met. You say, well, what's the urgency? You could, you could pick up that his need was quickly it wasn't later, it was now. 
So pay, pay attention. You say, well, I got a text from somebody in this room, and literally the text said, this couple said, hey, call us. It's not an emergency, but call us. You say, well, then did you call them? I didn't call them in that moment before the day was over because I know their situation. I called them because they got a lot going on. You say, well, see, that's it. You're the preacher. That's your job. Good luck with that again. My job, the elders in this church's job, our job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. I don't tell you these stories so you'll say, oh, good, I'm glad he's taking care of all that. I'm telling you the story so you'll get a life and realize it's your turn. And the way a church should work is, did you hear about so-and-so? They had a need. It got solved. It's all good. I'm like, that's great. But wait, but you didn't solve it? It's not about me. It's about him. It's about us. It's about you. Right? You get to have the fun. And then one more in this little passage here. Demas left me, and then uh, only Luke is with me, and then this little verse, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And if you go read about his relationship with Mark, not so good. Mark had ditched on him, and they're reconciled, and he says, bring him with you. So if you take a direct hit, what do you do? Backup shows up, and then you get back up. And you keep moving forward. If you go read the definitions for backup, here's another one. Someone who takes the place of another as when things get dangerous or difficult. A person, plan, device, kept in reserve to serve as a substitute if needed. I needed a backup. My plan did not work to save myself. But as it turns out, Jesus was not a backup plan. He was the plan. He was the plan all along. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord Jesus, for your life, and your willingness to come after us and stay after us. I thank you for the way you send reinforcements to encourage those on the battlefield. And I thank you for those on the battlefield who stay and fight. I also thank you for those that get transferred, Lord, somewhere else. Because sometimes the need is greater there in the same way you transfer people here. But I pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to stand and when all is said and done to still stand and hold the line in loving people, preaching the truth, and doing what you left us here to do, not just reach the lost but make disciples of all of those who, who follow you. For anyone, Lord, who is in this room or beyond and they are keenly, acutely aware of their need for you, and realize that their plan is not going to work and they have no backup plan. But they found out that there is another plan and it's you. And they would be willing to say, God, I, I am finally willing to admit I am a sinner and I have nowhere to take my sin. I believe that Jesus died on a cross, shed his blood, was buried and raised from the dead to pay for my sin and to purchase eternity for me in heaven with you and provide me the forgiveness of my sins and come and take up residence in my life and not just live in me but through me. I accept the gift of eternal life. I accept the forgiveness of my sins. I ask you to move in and take over. Thank you that I will never be alone again that my sins are forgiven. It's like getting a fresh start, being born all over, all over again. Thank you for loving me. Use my life. 
and help me be patient in the process as you turn me into the person that you've made me to be. And Father, for believers who uh, need to make a call and say, hey, we did get transferred, we just didn't know how to tell you that. Uh, and for people who think they were just looking for a church, and it turns out they are reinforcements. And I personally, Lord, am very grateful to you for backup. Thank you for one more day, for food to eat, clothes to wear, and that we have a reason for living and we have an answer when we die. And our prayer is even so. Come, Lord Jesus. And we pray it in his name. Amen. All right. Um, for anyone in this room or beyond, number one thing, if you prayed a simple prayer and said yes to Jesus and asked him to move in and you've never done that before, please let somebody know that. Um, you can send us a text, reunion at reunionchurch.org. Send an email to that address, reunion at reunionchurch.org. And just put in there, I prayed a simple prayer, um, and I know that he moved in. I just need some help taking next steps. We'd be more than happy to do that and help you. And if you're in the room, I'm happy to talk to you. I, I'm not hard to find. The elders here not hard to find. And I'm sure if you came with somebody, they'd be happy to talk to you as well. Uh, but we are here to help you and encourage you uh, in, your, in your journey. So, All right. Uh, we're going to do the offering. Red boxes at the door when you go out. Anybody that uh, want to do it that way, the website's been working fine. Re, uh, reunionchurch.org, there's a give tab there, and it's self-explanatory. If you have challenges with that, please call the office, um, and we'll help you with that. But very, very grateful. Um, it's interesting. Uh, people say, do you think you're going to make it? I'm like, oh, I know we're going to make it. Um, but the way we make it is he shows up through people. And I'm grateful for your obedience. So, all right. We're going to stand up, sing our way out of here. Um, love you guys. Pay attention to people around you. You might be their backup. And uh, hope you have a great rest of the day. God bless you.